Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Achano, and welcome back to episode two of Genesis. So basically, if you guys are unfamiliar with the series, we're taking a look at my old Blood and Dare game, starting with Genesis, my very first one. And we're going to see, basically, <laughs> what it is made out of and how we can fix it. And I'm just, I'm just going to talk about how I wrote the code and what things I did correctly, what things I did incorrectly. Um, and it should just be a nice little series where we take a look at how fun it is to make games in 24 hours, especially when you're not very good, which is the case with, uh, with Genesis. So this was my first game really that I wrote. And last episode, we kind of took a look at, uh, what it, what it actually was. So if you're not, if you're not sure what this game is, it's called Genesis. I made it in 2012 for Love and Dare 24. Here it is. Um, then you can click on the screen right now to go back to the first episode where I play the game and I talk about it a lot and I kind of give the director's commentary of what that game was. So uh, definitely make sure you watch that first episode. But um, episode two now, what we're going to do today really is just take a look at the code, right? I'm going to go through the code. I'm going to familiarize myself with it because I have not looked at it since, well, I haven't looked at it for like four years, right? Since I wrote it basically. Um, and I'm just going to kind of talk about it and I'm going to point out some things that could potentially become dedicated videos of like, let's fix this or let's rewrite this or let's make this work. Um, so, so yeah, it should be pretty fun. Um, and then from then on, like next episode, I think we'll actually start fixing or rewriting or, uh, analyzing like one specific part. Um, and we'll see how we go with that. And if you guys, of course, have any requests as to what you want to see videos about in terms of like, um, to do with this code base and everything, then just leave a comment below and I'll, uh, I'll see if I can make a video on that. Uh, the code is of course on GitHub. There'll be a link in the description of this video that'll take you to it. Uh, it's like github.com forward slash the channel forward slash, uh, Genesis. So yeah, anyway, <laughs> let's start. So the main, the main class is called game. Uh, we have our, um, main method right here. Game starts off pretty, I mean, calls a constructor of game, which sets some stuff up, mainly, you know, setting the size here three times. It's fun. Um, we got the screen here, uh, the screen class I'm assuming is going to actually do the rendering. We create a new sprite sheet and we don't assign this instance anywhere either, which is interesting. Um, input equals new input handler, sure. That's static as well. Um, we set menu level. What does that do? Okay. So it plays the menu theme. This is actually going to be quite interesting for me as well, because <clears throat> this was one of this, this was like the first kind of, if you can call it that complete game that I kind of wrote ever, I think. Um, and so, <clears throat> and so, um, it's going to be pretty, uh, it's going to be pretty interesting for me to see what that, what that was like and what that code, what that code base was all about. Um, but yeah, basically, <clears throat> um, okay. So we play the menu theme. We launch up the level. Notice these things are static by the way, which is cool. Public static. It's a, the favorite two words of a novice Java programmer. Um, but, uh, but in all seriousness, uh, here it's totally fine. Um, and then apparently we, I guess we add 20 menu mobs. So I assume if we just up that to 200 and launch this, we will have a lot of mobs. Yep many, many mobs, not enough mobs, many, many mobs. <laughs> That's better. It's, it's decent performance. <laughs> Fun times. All right. Anyway, that's not what we're going to do today. We're not going to mess around with stuff. Um, okay, cool. Uh, we start the game. Well, okay. That's the start math. Let's go. I'm, I, I always, when I'm reading source code, I always like there's Oh, I just realized half the screen's cut off. Hmm, that's not good. Wait, hang on. Yeah, half the screen's cut off. Not, not that you guys missed much, but I should probably fix that. Ah, that's, that's better. So now the screen's fixed. You know, I love these kind of videos where like, it's just like, let's just do it live. So anyway, um, we're back. Now you can see the full screen, which is going to be important for later on. Um, but, uh, I, as I was saying about source code, when I'm reading through source code, there's, you know, there's kind of one of two ways you can kind of go. You can either kind of just read it as the, as the page kind of goes, so to speak. So you kind of just read like, for example, this class just chronologically as, and you just go through each method like this. That's okay. But then 
There's also the other way that you could kind of read this, and that is actually follow the functions. So for example, we call game, and then that calls screen. So it's basically, I mean, to simplify my explanation, it's kind of like, do I look at this depth first or breadth first, right? Do I look at this just by following each kind of class and how it runs, or do I just kind of read each, each kind of component? So I like to usually combine the two kind of methods. So sometimes I'll see like, for example, there's no point in me reading what the start method does because it hasn't even get, gotten called yet. Um, but it also might be useful to just skim over it. So a few different ways, of course, to, uh, to deal with that. Um, okay, so this is the main game loop. Uh, as long as the game is running, you know, we have a little bit of a timer here. Of course, if the game is paused, then we do not update the game. So that's interesting. So I guess like, I guess there has to be something else that will unpause the game, right? How does paused work? So, so see, that's something else that I probably wouldn't do nowadays. Like in the main game loop, if not paused, update. Like that's not, I mean, update should still be running if the game is paused because we probably want to do a bunch of stuff. Uh, like input.update, for example, should probably get co get called if the game is paused. So if we made it so that we have a like a P key that just we press and, and then the P key pauses the game or something like that, or we press escape and it pauses the game, that currently wouldn't work because um, we, you know, we have, we basically stop all of our input uh, handling while the game is paused, it seems. We stop everything. So I guess the way that this game becomes unpaused, and if we just do control shift G, I think we can control shift F. No, that formats it. Is it alt shift? I have no idea. I think it's control shift G. I don't know why that didn't work. Yeah, there we go. Um, okay, well that's useless. That's private. When does this get set at all? Am I missing something? Okay, I guess the, I guess paused is always, is always false. Huh, maybe that was something I was going to add, but then didn't, okay, I guess. Okay, cool, whatever, moving on, Never mind that. Moving on, um, so the update, this is kind of the big one, there's update and render, I guess, which are the two big functions from which everything else stems after initialization. So time plus plus, we have a little, if time is greater than 65536, reset it to zero for some reason. Not sure why I wrote that. Doesn't really need to be done. I mean, I guess I didn't want the number going too high, but what is this like? It's an int anyway. I don't know exactly what my theory was with that. Maybe I thought that if it exceeded the maximum size of an integer, the game would crash. I don't know again what I was thinking, but who knows? Uh, Input.update. So, okay. So this is an interesting way of handling uh, input that I don't do nowadays. Um, and that was just basically creating a set of fairly hard coded kind of um, controls. So like up, down, left, right, use and back, right? Um, and then of course, running an update method, which queries the keys array to figure out what's going on, right? Um, and then of course, like release all, for example, what's the multi false. And then if the focus was lost, we, you know, we set all the keys to false and stuff like that. I don't really do that nowadays because it's a little bit confusing. Um, what I would do nowadays is probably have, um, well, first of all, I would probably make this class static and call it like keyboard or something. Um, and then, and I would probably separate, I think keyboard and mouse events. This, this didn't have a mouse, which is why I kind of combined everything in input handler. This game just uses a keyboard and that's it. Um, but I mean, overall, yeah, I would probably just um, have like some kind of method here, uh, you know, like public int or public boolean uh, is key pressed, right? And then you can take in a key event or just a key code, um, I guess. And then you would return, you know, keys, key code or something. And then you could do like some bounds checking if you really wanted to, to make sure that you don't crash the game. But anyway, um, and then of course the usage of that, and then that would probably be static, right? Because there's no reason for this not to be static. Um, as in, we've only got one keyboard attached to the computer and that's the, that's pretty much the, the intention, right? There's no way to really have two keyboards attached to a computer and use them without, um, you know, without doing some actual raw input kind of stuff. Like Java certainly will, will not support that anyway. That's, you're gonna have to get into like some Windows API stuff for that. So it's pretty much in 99% of cases, you're only gonna have one keyboard to deal with or the computer's gonna recognize two keyboards as one anyway. Um, again, unless you do like some crazy raw input stuff, that's what it's gonna be like. So there's no reason to not have a static keyboard class in 99% of cases. Um, so that's why I would do it that way. 
Um, and then you can, you know, make this static as well, obviously. And then everything is just going to work pretty well. Um, and that, that means that you just don't need to have um, any kind of instance of this floating around. I mean, you will need to supply Java with an instance, uh, which I do here, right, in these two. Um, but it's more or less like you don't need that instance to do anything with it now. So, for example, if we look at the main menu, I'm sure there are controls here like input.down and you can see that we have to kind of pass around this input handler, which is a bit annoying. Again, like something that you don't really need to do because instead with this current system, instead of doing something like, um, you know, if input down selected plus plus, you can just do input handler, handler dot is key pressed. Um, what is it? Key event dot VK down, right? You do something simple like this. Uh, and it's obvious what you're doing here as well. You don't need to pass around the instance or anything like that. And that should work the same way, right? You can see that I, of course, can navigate up and down, right? So that's one thing I would probably do. Again, if this was like a more professional game, then sure, like you might want to, of course, abstract, uh, you know, specific, the, the specifics of which key does what so that you could, you know, have like a, like a key mapping or something like that. Um, which you could kind of use uh, so that, of course, the the like your key commands essentially and your like controls would be configurable uh, and serial and serializable as like into an external configuration file, something like, something like that. Like it's totally um, it's totally there's a million, a million different ways you can do this, um, but one way not to do it is the way that I kind of did it, which which I really dislike this this kind of way of doing it, because it means that you essentially hard code all your controls inside a keyboard class, which you then have to pass instances of it around. It's again, it's not very elegant. I don't like it at all. So that's one thing. So we've already found something that I don't like, and I'm sure this, this game will be full of that, um, which is good. So I hope you guys enjoyed this kind of style of stuff. <laughs> um, again, I'm not gonna dwell too much on that, but I did show you guys kind of an alternative as to how I would do it. I mean, the other thing is I am passing instances around, but you'll notice that this is public static, right? So even with the old system um, inside like main menu, instead of passing an input, which of course I didn't have to do, um, I'm sure that like I, I, I started writing this when this wasn't public static, it was probably like private and well, it was definitely not static. Um, and then of course I then like, and, and at that point I created the main menu and then maybe later I made it static or something because obviously uh, if I wanted to, I could just, even if, even if this wasn't a static method, this is keep pressed, right? Even if it wasn't a static method, um, like for example, uh, down isn't a static, isn't down isn't a static field, right? I can still just do main dot, uh, or game dot input dot down, right? So I don't need to have that. Um, and that's still fine. So I, I don't need to have that that instance floating around there, right? So that's one thing that is um, a little bit interesting and a little bit weird and a little bit Ludum Dairy, right? And Ludum Dairy is like a little term I use when something is like Ludum Dare in the sense that it's like, it's it's kind of rushed, right? And it's kind of like, this is kind of the code that you write when you have 48 hours to make a game and you don't really care about details or coding practices, you just need to get the stuff down so it works. So you start jamming all this crap code in. It's pretty normal, right? Um, that's what game jams are like, unfortunately. Well, both unfortunately and fortunately, because sometimes you rip out some really killer code. I mean, nowadays, like the code that I write, of course, would, would be at a much higher standard than than what this was. But um, of course, back then I had, I think less than a year of just programming, like at all. It was less than a year, I think. Well, I made this game less than a year or about a year actually, since I actually just like first started programming. So, hey. It is what it is. Um, okay, so uh, we were in an update and we were kind of trolling through update and seeing, yeah, that's why we call it, we found input.update and I was like, that's interesting. Okay, so we update the menu if it's not null. That does nothing. Well, I mean, the virtual functions will do stuff, I assume. Um, in fact, they definitely will. So like main menu, for example, uh, will, this is the update method. So you can see the update method of all these menus is pretty huge. I mean, like the help menu and stuff, I think would just be, yeah, would just be like, well, first of all, so every menu maintains a timer it's set to 18, whatever that means. Um, I actually do know what that means. Uh, so 
One of the things that I did was last time, or rather when I wrote this game, <clears throat> was I didn't know how to make like a key typed type situation, right? So I didn't know how I could detect a single key press and not repeat presses. So repeat presses are where you, when you like, for example, press a key and then you hold it down. And then so you can see kind of how, like the way that Windows at least deals with that is uh, it sends one key, like one, one command, which is just a pressed, right? And you can see how there's a bit of a delay. Like if you look at this, um, uh, I was gonna say crosshair. If you look at the carrot here, right? Um, when I press like the right key, it advances one spot immediately and then there's a pause and then it advances more, right? So essentially we have the first press, which is not a repeated press. And then we have, you know, the same key being held down, but the repeat count goes up. So essentially what I wanted to achieve was by like the key typed thing is essentially have a way to only detect a key press if it was the first press. So if the repeat count was zero um, and there's no easy way to do that, I believe, in Java. Um, I don't think you can easily detect if a key is pressed or not. So what I always end up doing nowadays in Java um, is basically creating some kind of system where I keep track of which keys have been pressed but not released yet. So basically, as soon as a key is pressed, it goes into a list of pressed keys, right? And you can only essentially retrieve... Uh, like if, if you ask the input handler, if a key is typed, right, you can only retrieve it on the first iteration of it being pressed, right? So if it, if it gets pressed, right, then your game's update logic flows, it, it, it will retrieve the fact that that key is indeed typed that first time, then the input gets updated. And because it's still in the list, it's no longer typed, right? Like it's in, it's, it's still being held down. So the next time you go through everything, oops, sorry, microphone, the next time you go through everything, it's going to basically return false because that key is still being held down on the next loop. So that's what I end up doing nowadays in Java because there's no simple like, hey, I want to know if a key is pressed, but I also want to know what the repeat count is. No, you can't really do that. I don't think. I haven't looked it into it that like deeply. But of course, like in Windows and like in like in Sparky, for example, when you get a key event, you can easily check what the repeat count is. And then of course you can do something like if repeat count equals zero, then do this, right? And this is no way. So because I didn't back back at the at like this time, I didn't think of that weird system where I again can like manage the list of pressed keys. I didn't have any of that. You'll notice the input handler doesn't have any of that. Um, and so what I ended up doing, uh, was I ended up implementing this kind of timer mechanic where when, when, like when you press, if you're on the main menu and you press enter or, or space, or sorry, this is like on help on the help menu, right? Then you basically start an 18, uh, tick countdown, which is about like a third of a second or so. It's about 300 milliseconds. Um, because this update will be running at 60 times per second, right? 60 updates per second. So it's about 300 milliseconds of just this won't function, right? So if I hold it, if I hold down the enter key, you'll see it will actually return. Yeah, I'm just holding it down. However, if I just press it, it's not going to return immediately because there is that 300 millisecond delay. If I got rid of that, right? So you can see that this only works if timer is zero, right? So if I got rid of this whole timer mechanic, or for example, start of the timer at zero, then you'll see that if I press help, it's gonna basically flash and return back unless I'm really quick like that. See, it's actually really hard to get this to work. So that's why the timer exists in case you guys were wondering. Um, but yeah, it's a bit comedy. It's a bit of a hack obviously, um, but that's that's that was the extent of my knowledge back then. So I just solved the problem uh, by doing it this way. Obviously that's not good because it still doesn't work in the sense of like, if I want to hold this down, it shouldn't go back, right? It should wait for me to release the key and then press enter again or, sp or space bar, right? And that would make me go back. So it still doesn't work really as intended, but you know, whatever. <laughs> okay, so that's that. Um, and then of course we had a bunch of text here, which was this whole thing. I'm actually kind of surprised that, oh, okay, yeah. So this is how this worked, right? It was essentially an array of strings, right? One for each line. 
Uh, these weird comments here are for Eclipse's formatting because I use Control Shift F a lot, right? Which you can see will just auto format everything. Um, and <clears throat> and uh, by obviously like if you use Control Shift F and you don't have these comments here, then Eclipse will kind of make everything into one line. Okay, it actually won't in this case because my wrapping is set to. Let me quickly change that so I can really show you what I'm talking about. Because these are so these are some in-depth videos. So if I set the line wrapping to like 100 and like, I don't know, just like that, you can see that this is what it will do, right? And I always have my line wrapping really high usually because I don't want lines to get wrapped usually. Um, like as in I'll do it manually nowadays, but back then I was like not. So instead of creating these monsters, obviously if you put comments here, just empty comments. Eclipse can't move this line up here because if it did, this would now be a comment. So that's like a little hack to get Eclipse's format formatter to not do bad things or not do things that I don't want it to do. Um, okay, so this is what I did, right? There was essentially a an array of text, an array of strings, one a string for each line. And then I had a little for loop and this was in render notice. Um, and this wasn't even like a const or like a static little thing. So I guess this would be allocated every frame or something. I'm not sure if Java would at all optimize that. I mean, if this was like C++, I would have probably just chucked static out the front so that it only gets created once. But um, again, I'm not sure if, whatever. Like this does seem pretty dodgy. Um, and I'm assuming that's the same as that. It would have to be. There's no way like that stuff would have just been created on, on the stack, I guess. So. This is probably very inefficient, creating this, allocating this array every frame. Um, but you know, not, it doesn't matter too much. I mean, this game isn't particularly difficult to, to render um, or to like not, this game isn't, you know, a huge performance kind of uh, drag, so to speak. So anyway, um, over here in the for loop, I go through every line here and I render it twice. So I render it twice because the first time you can see I render it as black. So the last parameter here is the color. So zero is black, of course, this is white. It's a 24 bit color, um, RGB, <clears throat> RGB integer color. Um, and uh, we have zero for black, of course, uh, that for white. Um, and then of course you can see the black one, which is rendered first is actually offset by like two pixels right? Two pixels in, uh, in X and Y, in X and Y, right? So if we, for example, didn't have that, we would just see the shadow. And that's why you get like a, you can see that's just the shadow. And then that's that. And then the reason I did that was because this text was a bit hard to read. Like you can see that when it gets over like the rocks, for example, it's just, it's just not as easy to read quickly um, as, you know, if I have the shadow here, which just makes it a little bit, makes it pop a little bit more. So that was the reason for this, for this like shadow thing. And of course this for loop will just go through, through these, um, through these lines. And actually like the performance of that actually isn't that great. You can see this is about, no, it's, oh no, hang on, help. Yeah, so it's like a hundred and, 36 FPS. A lot of that I imagine is because of Java's rendering of the text. I imagine that's probably the bulk of it, but I'm sure that like for example, and we can prove that pretty easily if we just get rid of like that. You can see the FPS is now a lot higher. It's like doubled. <laughs> um, but also just out of curiosity, I do wonder if that array, so what was it like 150? Yeah, 150. I'm going to say 140. Sure. If I just move that up, does that make any difference? <sighs> Not really. All right. So, uh, it is a bit faster than that. It's about the same, right? So I'm sure the Java was doing something to be like, oh, you make this same thing every time. I'm going to not make it slow for you. Um, and of course the actual uh, slowness comes from Java's text rendering, which I again have no idea how that works, but it would be software based, I imagine. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, rendering that many rectangles, of course, for each character is not gonna be particularly fast if you're on a software renderer. So yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and then of course this was the, <laughs> the shadow and then the main text for, um, for options 
which was just back. Okay, options was like a list of, was supposed to be like a list of options you could press. So main menu, for example, you can see has um, a bunch of options, play, help, and about, right? And then essentially I iterated through. I'm actually quite happy with myself that I didn't just create like separate, like I, I mean, I used arrays and stuff. Like that's pretty cool, right? Like I didn't just like create, you know, <clears throat> private string play, private string help, private string about or something. I made like an array out of this so that I could iterate over it when I like rendered it, for example, over here, which is pretty cool, right? Um, and of course there's this stuff, which is, yeah, just like the main title and everything. And I also, as I mentioned in the other video, I also really like that the menu for this, like is like on top of, oops, the menu for this is like on top of a live kind of level. I think that's really cool. Um, and something that, uh, that I wish I would do more often. I'm probably going to do that next time. I really like menus that like, for example, I think Half-Life 2's menu, for example, was, I believe it was on some kind of like live kind of level as in like, it, you know, it, I mean, it, I guess it wasn't really cause it like it moved and stuff, but there wasn't like a full kind of playthrough going on or anything. But like, instead of just having like a video in the background or just a solid like background, I, I really like this idea of having an actual, having the game actually play, right? Which means that first of all, it's gonna be all random like it is here. And also you get to see the day night cycle and it's pretty, it's pretty cool. So I'm kind of a little bit proud of myself for, uh, for thinking of that. Uh, I think that's a cool idea. Um, <clears throat> not that it's like original or anything, but just something, a little something cool. Uh, in this in this very cool critically acclaimed game. Okay, so uh, what else do we have? Uh, the about menu, again, that's pretty basic. You can see every one of these has this timer mechanic. I'm not sure why I wouldn't just make it like in menu, for example. I mean, I could have implemented the timer mechanic here and then just called super.update from each of these things. And then that would have handled this line of code and this line of code. <laughs> uh, without me having to implement it in each subclass. So that would have been nice. I mean, I still would have had to have, had to have had this, but at least it wouldn't be, um, you know, this whole thing every time. Um, yeah, anyway, whatever. Um, also I released all the input every time I pressed enter, which was interesting. I think that, yeah, the help menu does that as well. That's interesting. Just setting everything to false. Um, oh, and I know why. I think that's because no, actually, I'm not sure why. That might have had something to do with not not processing input too quickly or something. I'm not sure. Okay, uh, so I mean, I've been talking a lot about menus. So let's take a look at the actual. Like, what are we at? Like, 20 minutes? It's going to be a long video. Buckle up. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about. Uh, should we talk about graphics or the actual game mechanics? Man, these videos, man. Oof. Let me know what you think about the pacing of these videos. Because like, I mean, what I'm doing right now is taking a while and I'm not sure if you would prefer me to just hurry them up, especially because these are like the intro videos as in we're not actually doing anything. We're just kind of looking at the code. So I don't know, maybe like for next episode, I might accelerate it and I'm not sure what you guys think of this. So maybe you just like me rambling on about my, my game. I'm not sure. So leave a comment below and I'll, I'll see if I can adjust, but I, I'm kind of enjoying this. So I'm going to keep doing it this way. I think for now until I get some feedback. Um, so we're going, what we're going to do this video is we're going to probably cover graphics and then next time we'll cover game mechanics. So like how, like how the, how the game logic was implemented. Uh, but we'll talk about graphics now. Um, so level and entity and all the, all the, all those kind of packages we'll talk about next time. Uh, cause we've talked about like menus and let's quickly talk about sound. Cause there's not much to this. Um, so this was using the applet kind of sound that Java provides. It's extremely limited. The only advantage of it is it's built right into Java. So you don't have to get any kind of external library. And you also don't have to load in Java effects, which again, kind of counts as an external library because you don't get it by default. Um, so essentially I used uh, the Java applet kind of sound for that. Um, the only, the, 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 really the bad thing with it, apart from the fact that it's a very limited API is that it only supports WAV files. Like it might support some other files, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't support stuff like OG. 
Um, OGG is really the, the good one, the good format. I mean, MP3 is kind of like MP3 typically isn't used in games because of its license, but OGG is pretty solid. OGG, right? So I, I do use that nowadays, but, um, back then, of course, I just used WAV, WAV files because they were easy to implement in the code, right? Of course I knew that they were terrible, but, um, but they were kind of easy to implement. The reason they're terrible is because of the size of them, right? I mean, they're not terrible, they're good, but they're terrible for games because you don't really need that like ridiculously high quality. And it's not even that it's ridiculously high quality, it's just that there's no compression, right? Um, so you end up with pretty huge files and I'm just trying to find where on earth my workspace is at. And we're back, so, um, Written resources, you'll see the sound is nuts. Like if we were to look at the size here, you can see that like, you know, all the, all the sound effects are fine. But the, um, <laughs> I mean, the main theme is 58 meg, right? And then the menu theme is 24 meg, which is crazy. I mean, this does go for like five minutes, which is why it's five minutes, 11 seconds, which is the entire duration of the game. Um, and then this goes for two minutes. So they're, they are quite long, but you can see that the, the absolute bulk of this, like, I mean, this sound folder is 81 megabytes, which is totally unacceptable. Um, it's way too large, which is a problem because of course it took me a while to upload and with Australia's internet and it took me, and it, it just takes a while to download from slow servers that are being, um, like for example, I was, I think I was self hosting this back in 2012 from like one of my servers, which back then of course was, um, a just a shared like five dollar per month type deal so it was downloading at like i mean the, it, the speed of the download would drop to zero bytes per second frequently because so many people were trying to download it at once um and then of course when it was released on let and dare and stuff people were trying to download it and it was just that was bad right that was bad for distribution because first of all people had to wait like an hour to download it and no one wanted to do that so thus less people played it but also um also, it's just, it's, you know, bandwidth wise for the server. I mean, I would have had unlimited bandwidth with that terrible shared hosting thing, but still it was, it's just not, um, it's not a great way to stay in shape, so to speak. So, uh, I would have of course minimized this to like an OG file, which probably would have reduced the total size from 80 megabytes to like two or something, which would have been totally acceptable and totally fine. Okay. Maybe not two, maybe like five to 10, but still, uh, would have been a lot smaller. So that's, that's the sound situation. And there's nothing much to it here. You load it just by doing applet.newaudioclip. I believe you have to have this in the jar file though, which is why you can see I'm using sound.glass.getResource, right? So I'm getting it relative to the jar file, essentially. Um, which is why all this has a forward slash, a leading forward slash in front of it. Uh, because it is um, essentially just getting it from the, it's getting it in, it's getting it from inside the archive, which is the Java archive, which is the Java file. Um, so yes, whereas that's another thing I should note, by the way, I believe I do that for everything. So if we look at texture, is that a class? No. Sprite sheet? No. Well, I mean, yes, also, you can see that also gets the resource from here, but I believe game would have done that, right? Yeah, so you can see I, I just get that from slash sprites and I get levels from slash levels. So yes, essentially I was packing everything into the one, uh, into the, I was packing everything into the Java archive. And the reason I was doing that, the big reason I was doing that was because of course I was releasing this as an applet as well. And back in the day, back in my day, right? Back in 2012, not that that was that long ago, but back then, uh, applets worked right? They don't now, obviously, because of security issues and because Java's terrible and because everything just, and, I mean, applets are terrible, I will be honest. But back then, at least they, they, it was possible to get them working and it was pretty easy, actually, uh, to get them to run inside a web browser, which was perfect. But uh, nowadays, it's just not going to happen. So no one should be making applets nowadays. Um, if you're making a game in Java, you should just be making it downloadable. I mean, that's really the only way. Um, if you want to use a, if you want it to work on the web, then you're going to have to write some kind of wrappers or some, something like that. And it's going to have to be compiled in something else. Like for example, Sparky and other game engines such as Unity and, and Unity and, uh, Unreal as well, will use mscripten to basically compile into JavaScript, right? Um, I mean to compile their core engine, which is written in C++ for both Unity and Unreal into, they will, they, they will compile that into. JavaScript, and then they can, of course, just load in the asset files and 
as if as if it was on running on desktop. It's just the JavaScript's loading it now. So um, that's the way they get their stuff working with WebGL. And of course, Unity did have that web player thing, which it is retiring because that was kind of like an applet. Um, and that's, of course, Chrome is like blocking that stuff. So that's all being disallowed. So everything is moving towards WebGL, which requires kind of mscript and to, com to convert your C++ code into JavaScript. Very, very magical how it actually does that. But um, <laughs> it, it works. And I have made Sparky work with that as well, which is, uh, it's been about a year since I had a working version of Sparky with mscriptins, but I would like to kind of uh, get that running again. Anyway, getting a bit sidetracked here, um, but that's that's the deal. So because it was written as an applet, I had to make sure that everything was packaged inside the jar file because applets are not particularly forgiving even back then with loading external files. Nowadays, since most of the games I make are for desktop, uh, or like, you know, essentially not for web, right? I would, um, I definitely load them as separate files. I don't, I never package anything. Not that I use Java too much nowadays anyway, but even if I did, like I would be having them as standalone folders and they wouldn't be in a, um, they wouldn't be in, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be packaged inside the Java file. All right, graphics. Let's quickly look at this. Chernocolor.java. Now, I would have called this class color, but I didn't want to because of the Java color thing. Um, so that's one thing that I guess I just decided to call it channel color so there wouldn't be any confusion and I, so that I wouldn't have to use the package um, namespaces directly every time I wanted to use channel color or Java color or something. So I decided to just call this channel color. Uh, this is a static class, it looks like. Yep, it's got two methods, change brightness and tint. So tint, I believe, what does that actually do? Tint. Oh, okay. So you, you provide a color and it essentially will add, um, it will it will add or subtract uh, from each channel of this color, whatever you give it in the RGB, right? So if you say like the color is white and then you say minus 10 plus 10 plus 10 or something, then it will subtract 10 from the red color and add 10 to both the green and blue channel, right? So I guess it's kind of a tint effect um, ish, but you do provide this stuff. Uh, and then I guess, yeah, I mean, it, it's a tint effect. It's pretty simple. Um, that's the main code for that. Um, oh, and these are doubles. Why are these doubles? Why are these doubles? I mean, they're getting cast to end anyway. That is peculiar. So the it, tint is used in, oh, because the intensity is a double. Okay, interesting. I guess, I guess I just didn't want to cast it here, so I moved the cast into tint. But yeah, so the tinting is used by the light rendering, and the reason I do that is because, um, and it gets tinted to RGB. So you can. That's kind of cool, actually. So what I ended up doing for the lighting is I essentially ended up um, like when I rendered a light, I could give it a, a color. And this is actually very mild, but you can see that the color we end up with is kind of a blue kind of, it actually doesn't have much red in it, surprisingly. Um, one thing we can do, by the way, because I do want to see what this looks like, but I also don't want to wait around a lot, is I believe we can actually change the speed at which time increases. So day and night. Brightness, so the brightness changes, right? So it's just plus plus. Oh, this is some weird code. So we have return statements here and then just a brightness plus plus, just anyway. <laughs> that is interesting. Um, and yeah, this definitely is not fantastic code. I would have done something like just if else if and then not returned because that means that this time thing is a bit weird, but anyway, um, there's the t there's there's the speed of the time being called. Um, so essentially, if we can, we'll have to set this to a multiple of fifty, essentially, or something that is something that, yeah, not really a multiple of fifty, a something that that, that is divisible, um, that fifty divides into, essentially. So like five or ten would work, uh, but if we make it five times faster, and that's probably still not fast enough. Let's make it ten times faster. So unfortunately we can't make it like 20 times faster because if we do that, then, 
Yeah, there we go. So you can see how fast that's going now. Um, so if I, and it will pause, it won't pause, so I better hurry. So I can like, for example, tint this to like 105 or something. Um, and I, I think it should essentially make it red, but I don't think it did. Hmm. That intensity is tiny, I guess. But also, I'm not sure why that didn't tint it very well. I don't know, man. I don't know how this works. I'm just guessing. Okay, that uh, that's not red. But you can see kind of how that works. I mean, I'm sure that I'm not clamping something, which is why this is happening. But yeah, you can see kind of how the color tinting works, right? Yeah, it's totally not red. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, that's that. Um, that's Cherno color. Uh, and then the other one is brightness. So change brightness. So basically you provide a color. So th these functions are very, very simple, right? You essentially provide a color and you provide an amount that you want to modify, right? Same with both of these. And then essentially it will uh, make sure, well, it'll clamp the amount to a certain range, in this case, zero to negative 150, right? So basically when you change the brightness of something, in this case, you can't make it brighter. It has to be, this has to be a negative number. Uh, it has to be between negative uh, 150 and zero. Um, and uh, of course it will literally just add the amount to each color channel. And then of course it will just make sure that the color channels are all clamped um, correctly. Again, I should have just written like a clamp function cause I'm clamping a lot here. Um, in fact, all of these are clamping. Whenever you're dealing with solo colors, you're always clamping anyway. Um, and then of course I uh, do that. So in case you guys are unfamiliar, this is really simple. So extract each channel from this main color, uh, do some stuff, um, apply the amount, right? Make sure, you know, clamp the color, clamp each channel to its bounds, which is zero to 255, and then reconstruct the color back into a single integer. Um, so that's the, all the channels separately, right? Because each channel takes up one byte. Um, and that's pretty much it. So this change brightness would be used for making everything darker, which is what happens at nighttime. So you can see it happens in like, well, render mob and stuff. And this is all the lighting stuff that actually doesn't work. Lighting is definitely one thing I'm going to fix in this game. Cause the mob, there are, there are lighting bugs with the mobs and with the player. Uh, but also, you know, for render tile as well, we can see that the color changes based on the level brightness and the level brightness of course, um, changes when this time gets ticked, which is like not very often. It's going to, it's, I mean, this was, this was just time plus plus. So it essentially ticks once per second ish, right? It's a bit faster cause it's mod 50, not mod 60. If it was mod 60, it'd be exactly once per second. So it's a little bit faster than once per second, but essentially once per second, we, in this case would, you know, change the brightness. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why I needed to have two variables for day night. I could have just had a Boolean day. And then of course, if day is false, then night is true. Like I've kind of got going on over here. So I'm not sure why I made two Booleans for this stuff, I guess, like, because the only advantage of this is it provides a state in which either it is both night and day or it is neither night or day, which of course can't be a thing. So a little bit weird, but anyway, it is what it is. Um, has it been like 40 minutes? Holy crap, I've got, stuff to do with my life. Sorry, I have to wrap this up. Um, we're going to talk about the graphics and the rendering next episode. And then if we have time, which I bet we won't, because I seem to be stretching out these videos just massively. Um, we will, uh, oh, I'm so tired. We will, um, do that thing that I will do that thing that I said we would do. Yeah, the game, the, like the game logic and all that stuff. All right. So anyway, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit the like button. Leave your feedback as to what you think. If I'm going too fast, if I'm going too, f if I'm going too fast, <laughs> if I'm going too slow or something, or you're not enjoying this, or you think this is terrible, or you think it's great, or you want more of this, just leave a comment below, and I'll sort, I'll sort you guys out. Um, and that's about it. So I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. Vroom.